my straw. <laughs> Our next speaker is Jenny Fisher. And she tells me she's never gone fishing. But she predicts in her models changes in the climate. Jenny heralds from Caltech and Harvard University. <coughs> but now she's with your W. Last year was a record-breaking year for Australia. Now, I'm not talking about cricket scores or Olympic athletes or even the strength of the Australian dollar. I'm talking about the climate. This past summer was dubbed the angry summer in Australia because over 150 climate records were broken during the summer alone, ranging from heat waves to droughts to the early onset of bushfires. And these types of extreme climate events have major implications for our lives here in Australia. But these are not just Australia's problems. Climate change is a global issue, and as such, it's garnered the attention of a global community, of the public, of the media, and also of scientists. There is a large global community of scientists working together to try to understand both the causes and the impacts of climate change. And before I go any further, I'd like to give you a sense of the scale of that community. And it's embodied nowhere better than in the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Now, in late 2013, the IPCC released the physical science section of its fifth assessment report. And this was not just the work of a couple of people sitting together in a darkened room. These 14 chapters were the culmination of five years of work by over 800 authors from 40 different countries. And these 800 authors were synthesizing results from 9,000 independent papers, each one written by a multitude of co-authors, and incorporating over 50,000 comments from external expert reviewers. That is the scale of the climate science community. And of their many conclusions, the first one, quoted from page one of the Summary for Policymakers, was that warming of the climate system is unequivocal. And since the 1950s, Many of the changes are unprecedented over decades to millennia. Now, that's a really strong statement, and it may make you wonder where it comes from and what it represents, and how these people can take all of these independent papers, all of these individual data points, like the data points on this map, and turn them into simple, no, 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 <laughs> simple broad statements about the Earth system. And that process is what I want to talk to you about today. Now, um, yeah, that process of how do we understand what is going on in our Earth system. I'm going to talk about that from the lens of atmospheric chemistry, which is one of many subfields in climate science, and it's the subfield that I'm part of. And in atmospheric chemistry, we're concerned with the composition of our atmosphere, the gases and the particles, where they come from, where they end up, and how they change as they move from one place to another. And these types of questions are complicated and they're multifaceted and they require communities of people working together to answer them. And there are lots of tools that need to be used, but ultimately answering these types of questions has to start with measurements. Sorry, back. <laughs> now, in the atmospheric chemistry community, there are lots of different types of measurements going on. There are scientists working in labs making measurements and running experiments there. There are scientists out in the field making measurements from all sorts of platforms, from the surface, from airplanes, from ships, and even from satellites in space. And these measurements are being made in all sorts of different places across the world and also in different types of environments. There are scientists making measurements right at the source of pollutant emissions, at factories or fires. And there are scientists making measurements much further downwind where the impacts are likely to be felt in the middle of a city or a suburb, or in a pristine environment like a national park, or out to sea. And with all of the measurements they're making, these scientists are doing something that's more than just taking a measurement, something really important. And that is that they're interpreting their measurements. They're placing them in the context of our current understanding about the atmosphere, 
and they're using them to grow that understanding, to grow and test the theories about the, physical, the fundamental physical and chemical processes that govern what happens in the atmosphere. So that question that I posed before about the process, it really boils down to this. How can we combine all of this? How can we harness the knowledge and the brain power and the effort and the energy of an entire community and use it to come up with fundamental conclusions about the planet and also to make predictions about our planet? And there are many answers to that question, but one answer, and the one that I use, is through the use of models. Now, models are often misunderstood and they're occasionally maligned in the media, but really the concept of a model is conceptually very simple. Models represent all of this put together. They're a synthesis of our understanding of that fundamental physics and chemistry born out of the observations, put together in a self-consistent way. And they are constantly evolving to take into account new information that comes from every new set of measurements. So if our understanding comes straight from these measurements, it may make you wonder, why bother with models? What can we get from models that we can't just get out of the observations alone? And to answer that, I'm going to show you a picture. But I'm not going to show you the whole picture. Instead, I'm going to show you the picture viewed through a couple of distinct keyholes. Now, from these keyholes, you can learn things. You see that there are colors and that there are lines, and you can see that some of them are related, though it's not entirely clear how. But there are also things about the picture that you can't understand from these keyholes alone. You have no idea what's happening in the middle of the picture or on the upper left. These keyholes represent the locations in Australia where we have continuous measurements of some types of atmospheric composition. We don't, and feasibly we cannot, have observations everywhere all the time. We can't take a measurement at every point on Earth, at every elevation in the atmosphere, at every moment. Even with all the money in the world, it's feasibly impossible. But luckily, our understanding of the atmosphere, that fundamental physics and chemistry, it doesn't stop where these observations stop. The observations set the stage. They allow us to build up and test those theories. By synthesizing them, by incorporating them into our models, we can apply our understanding to places of the world where no observations exist, like the northwest of Australia, allowing us to fill in the gaps and unveil the bigger picture. And models can also take us further. As one example, they can help us understand where our air comes from and where it ends up. Imagine a team of scientists makes a measurement at a factory in Indonesia of the emissions coming out. And another team of scientists makes a measurement at Darwin on a polluted day. Now, Darwin's pretty close to Indonesia. It might be tempting to say that this pollution is coming from that factory. But the atmosphere is a much more complicated place than that. As stuff is emitted and moves in the atmosphere, it mixes. So the emissions from that factory might mix with fires in the Northern Territory or with pollution emissions from cars in Darwin itself. It can rain, and some species of pollution might fall out of the atmosphere. And chemistry is happening all the time, sometimes turning harmful species into benign ones, and sometimes working in the other direction. So if we want to really establish that link, what would be really great would be if we could just put a little label on every molecule that comes out of that factory in Darwin and count how many of them end up in Darwin on that day. Well, with models, that is exactly what we can do. We can run experiments on the atmosphere that we could never run in the real world. We can label every molecule from the factory, but we can also label every molecule from all of the different sources around the world. And we can count how many of them end up in Darwin or in other places across the world. For example, here in the Illawarra. And when we do that model experiment, when we count up all of the molecules for one particular gas and see how many of them end up here in the Illawarra, this is the picture that emerges. And from this picture, we can see two things very clearly. The first is that what we do in Australia matters to the air that we breathe here, as we'd expect. The cars that we drive and our industries, and even the bushfires that burn in our national parks and the trees that grow in our backyards. All of these things influence the composition of our air here. And we can also see the same activities happening across the world in far-flung regions, in South America, in Africa, in Asia. They have an influence on the composition of our air here as well. Now, this is just one picture. 
This is for one gas in the atmosphere, it's for one location, it's for one year. But with models, we can build up lots of these pictures. We can run lots of these experiments, and we can look at different regions across the world to see what the impacts of different activities are. And doing that kind of work leads to a lot of interesting conclusions, and it leads to even more further questions. But today, I want to just leave you with one very simple message. And that is that our atmosphere has no borders. Just as our air here in the Illawarra is influenced by activities going on across the world, so too do our activities, our emissions, our choices, have impacts that extend beyond our borders. Climate change, air pollution, these types of environmental problems are truly global issues, and we cannot think of anywhere, Australia or anywhere else, in isolation. Thank you.